let's get going. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Lawrence Haddad. I am the Executive Director of the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, or GAIN, and I'd like to welcome you all to this n side event, Private Sector Nutrition Action, New Data to Inform Commitments on Supply Chain Workforce Nutrition. And I would like to give a special warm welcome to our keynote speaker, the Honorable Secretary, Mr. Eshan E. Haladi, Secretary of, um, of the Ministry of Labor and Employment in Bangladesh. And we'll hear more from him in a few minutes. And colleagues, in a world where one in three people are malnourished, it seems self-evident, doesn't it? To help nourish your bottom line, nourish your employees. And this was the focus of the first NFG event we had on workforce nutrition, and that was held on November the 16th. Today, we're going to look at even more transformative initiatives, initiatives, ones that go way beyond improving the nutrition of your own workforce to improving the nutrition of workforces of others upon who you depend. I'm talking, of course, about workers in your supply chains. They are likely more vulnerable to malnutrition than your own employees. Uh, and if these workers are not adequately nourished, your supply chains will not supply. Uh, your chains will have missing links. Your ability to build back better will suffer because your ability to respond to any demand recovery will be hampered. Uh, your competitors that do invest in workforce nutrition will have the edge. So why is that? Well, in, in really stark economic terms, we know that the benefit cost ratios of investment in workforce nutrition uh, is about between three to one and six to one. So every dollar, rupee or peso you invest in these programs, you'll get them back in multiples. But there's no reason for this return on investment to be any lower in your supply chains than it is in your headquarters. In fact, it's almost certainly higher because your supply chains probably source from areas of the world where malnutrition is much more prevalent. But there are many other benefits. And in 2018, GAIN and New Foresight decided to examine the returns to workforce nutrition in supply chains. And we found that for brands and buyers, workforce nutrition really improved brand reputation, uh, quality assurance, and sustainability performance. And for producers or, or ingredient suppliers, workforce nutrition really increased revenues, reduced costs, and crucially attracted new buyers. So today we'll hear more, some more from the Access to Nutrition Index, uh, sorry, Access to Nutrition Initiative, ATNI, on their own research and findings in this area. Now, what is a workforce nutrition program? Well, the evidence tells us there are four elements, providing healthy food at work, nutrition education, uh, breastfeeding support, and nutrition-related health checks. And yet the recent World Benchmarking Alliance, who we will also hear from today, report only, they report only a quarter of the 350 companies actually have a program in place. So it's clear there's a lot of work to do. So with the Consumer Goods Forum, uh, GAIN set up the Workforce Nutrition Alliance in 2019 to help companies accelerate their ability to reach millions of workers in their headquarters and in their supply chains with impactful nutrition programs. And today we're gonna to hear from two companies who are currently reaching supply chain workers with workforce nutrition programs. They are the VF Corporation, which is in the garment sector, and Olam, a leading trader for food commodities. And neither company is a consumer facing entity in a classic sense. They're more focused on engaging with producers and brands and buyers. What do they stand to benefit from workforce nutrition programs um, among supply chain workers? We will hear from them directly on that matter. Uh, so today is really a, a call to action as well for other companies. Commitment making for the Nutrition for Growth Summit, which is less than two weeks away, uh, commitment making is ongoing and many companies have made their commitments, including Olam, Unilever, DSM, Google, Ajinomoto. And with some of these commitments, will reach companies, uh, supply chain workers. So we want to encourage all workforce commitments 
not just some, but all, to include reaching supply chain workers. They are the workers who will probably benefit the most from these programs. And if they benefit the most, they will help your company benefit the most. So without any further ado, let me warmly welcome uh, Eshan E. Elahi, who is the Secretary of the Ministry of Labor and Employment in Bangladesh. Excellency, over to you. Thank you very much. Respected speakers and team members of this sessions. Thank you all. Thank you for the warm welcome to me. My, in my country, good afternoon, and you are all of you may be the good morning. It is my pleasure to be with you today. The government of Bangladesh is honored to co-lead this side event at the N4G summit, together with the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. As workforce nutrition is critically important to the well-being of our people and economy. Respected speakers, as government of Bangladesh, we are committed to ensure food and nutrition security for all as it's part of the constitution of Bangladesh, Article 18.1. The state shall regard the raising of the level of nutrition and the improvement of public health as among its primary duties. In our vision 2021 and 2041, we have already achieved our vision 2021 because we already graduated the underdeveloped uh, middle income countries. And we have one of the vision 2041, we have to reach our goal as a developed country. And we have eight five year plan, perspective plans, all are linking with SDGs. And also second national plan of action of nutrition and national food and nutritional security policy. 2020, we have highlighted the importance of workforce nutrition for productivity of Bangladesh and economic growth. Though the country has made great progress in nutritional outcomes, we are striving to multi-sector stakeholders action to combat the challenges. Estimates show that in our country, 39.9% of reproductive aged women are anemic and despite high rates of undernutrition. We also see an emerging problem of overweight and obesity. With 22.2% .2 of women are overweight and 18% of men are overweight. In Bangladesh, we have already taken great strides to ensure the health and well-being of the workers of the manufacturing companies as well as workers working in both formal and informal sectors. Distinguished speakers and also team members, those who are with the committed in virtual platform. As you all know that Bangladesh's ready-made garment sector is vitally important. As this sector has created employment opportunities for an estimate 3.5 million workers. In that workers, 61% are women. This sector is also one of the vital contributors to GDP growth. Clearly, nutrition is a driver for economic growth and a win-win for workers, business, and the country's economy. Workforce nutrition programs implemented by Bangladesh's ready-made garment sectors are already repaying rewards. And in my introductory speech, I have already mentioned, under my ministry, we have one of the directorate. This is the DIFI, Department of Inspection for Factories and Establishment. They are fully responsible to monitor the all kinds of welfare of the laborers in the, not only government sectors, in both sectors, formal and informal sectors. For workers, their nutritional status has improved, especially reducing anemia and as much as 
though the provision of nutritionally enhanced lunches and iron folic acid supplements. For the businesses, these programs have led to immediate business benefits, including increased quality of products and productivity of line workers, a decline in sick leave, reduced medical costs, improved employee morale, and healthy diets have a large gain on mental health. For our government, our economy is tender and we are able to contribute towards advancing four sustainable development goals, SDG 2 on zero hunger, SDG 3 on good health and well-being, SDG 5 on gender equality, and SDG 8 on decent work and economic growth. And let us not forget that in light of COVID-19, workers' health has never been more important. So distinguished get the rule of government to support workforce nutrition as a mechanism to boost economies and combat malnutrition should not be underestimated. We also encourage actions from the private sectors and call on leading companies to make strong commitments in the nutrition for growth summit on, in December 2021. It is my hope that this side event will advance this commitment making and I look forward to hearing today from those important companies that have joined us. These companies have the opportunities to lead the way with their workforce nutrition commitments and to set the bar high for other private sector commitments. Together, government and businesses can advance workforce nutrition in ways that will create a better world for everyone, everywhere. Thank you. Again, Thank you. let us make and forge commitments for healthier employees and employers. Thank you very much for patient sharing from my space. Thank you again. Thank you, Honorable Secretary. I've been doing this for a very long time and it's wonderful to hear a senior representative from a ministry of labor and employment talk about anemia in women of reproductive age. I don't think I've ever heard that before. So it's just wonderful, the leadership you're showing and uh, the leadership that you uh, are showing around engaging with businesses as well. Thank you so much for stressing that work, that nutrition is a driver for economic growth and the returns to workforce nutrition for businesses will be direct and immediate. Um, now we turn to two speakers who are going to give us a sense of the state of workforce nutrition in supply chains. Um, Mariah Boomsmurf is the program director for the Access to Nutrition Initiative, and she will tell us about some of their uh, APNE's research, action research on workforce nutrition in supply chains. And then we will have uh, Victoria de bourbon de Palm, who is the Food Transformation Lead at the World Benchmark Alliance, and she will tell us how all of this aligns with the WBA recent survey results. So Mariah, over to you first. Thank you, Lawrence, and also thank you, Honorable Secretary. Um, and thank you uh, all for joining uh, this session. Um, I will now um, present to you the a preview of our findings of uh, our research that we did in um, uh, supply chain um, workforce nutrition. Um, ADNI's, uh, ADNI is driving change uh, by developing accountability tools um, that track uh, the food industry's investments in uh, tackling undernutrition, obesity, and diet related chronic diseases. Um, these accountability tools are, for instance, our global indexes uh, assessing the food industry worldwide, but also spotlight indexes in countries. And we have um, a methodology that covers uh, several uh, nutrition topics. And one of those is employee and consumer health and wellness in orange uh, at the left uh, bottom of this slide. Um, since the last global index, we uh, started to include also uh, questions, indicators uh, to ask companies um, what they also do for uh, supply chain uh, workers. 
um, and we wanted to know more about this and that was the reason for developing our action research program uh, on workforce nutrition and supply chains. This action research was uh, focusing on uh, six case studies across different sectors and different workplace situations. So we looked into tea, cocoa, coffee, horticulture um, and garments um, in different supply chain uh, workforce settings for focusing at factory workers, farm estate workers and smallholders. The aim of this research is to generate new insights uh, to share with all of you and also to motivate companies uh, to learn from others, but also to uh, feed into our index methodologies uh, for the future. Next slide, please. So why, why is it so important um, to uh, focus on workforce nutrition beyond your own, um, your own staff members, uh, workers? Um, well, uh, Lawrence already mentioned it. Um, at this uh, moment, there are three and a half billion people globally that forms our workforce. Um, and one in five jobs contribute to global supply chains. And a big majority of those are situated in low middle income countries where malnutrition is um, disproportionately high. Um, for instance, 18% of the agricultural workers, 12% of the manufacturing workers in low middle income countries are um, underweight and a large proportion again of those are uh, women and uh, the honorable secretary already mentioned, for instance, garments workers where many women are uh, part um, and many of those are suffering iron deficiencies and anemia. This that is often directly associated with work conditions, so the food environment that uh, people work in, but also the low incomes, long working hours, etc. Um, and that doesn't only affect workers, but also uh, their households and communities. Um, and um, we believe that, uh, and we know that multinational companies, the bigger companies, the buyers, they have uh, power, resources, and reach to uh, positively impact um, those workers within their companies, but also in their supply chains. Next slide, please. We asked the uh, case studies that we've looked into um, we asked them, why then are you doing those programs? And there's basically four reasons, which I think are also important for uh, companies that do not yet do those programs to consider. First of all, a big um, uh, a positive impact of those programs is by investing in uh, workforce nutrition and supply chains, you can increase the supplier's profitability, reducing productivity, um, having a lower staff turnover and thereby increasing uh, the resilience of uh, those suppliers as well as the supply chains, which indeed uh, has become um, even more important uh, since the COVID era. Secondly, uh, for the buyers, it is, uh, it is having a, a positive impact on their relationship with suppliers and therefore um, it helps in securing supply Thirdly, um, to reduce um, these programs uh, can reduce reputational risks, um, which are associated with not addressing uh, issues with malnutrition and supply chains. And fourthly, uh, companies brought up that they find it important to take responsibility um, for the well being of workers also in the supply chains and contributing to the SDGs. Next slide. We um, have uh, various uh, case studies, six, and all together they cover 30 different interventions. They are, um, uh, well, they can be grouped in those four different uh, programs that uh, Lawrence was already mentioning, um, giving uh, for, uh, access to healthy food at work, uh, nutrition education and behavioral change, breastfeeding support and nutrition focused health checks. Um, and you see a few of these case uh, studies mentioned here, um, focusing at school, the farmers, farm estates and factories and Olam and uh, VF uh, Corporation will tell you more about their programs later in this session. Last slide, please. 
concluding uh, remarks, and you can read much more about uh, this in uh, the report and the business cases that we're going to launch uh, around the Nutrition for Growth Summit um, in uh, December. Um, but what we find important to mention here is that there is a business case for investing in uh, workforce nutrition, also in supply chains. We've seen short and longer term effects. It does, however, require that uh, interventions are tailored to, of course, the malnutrition needs, local preferences, cultural habits and environmental factors. And also that companies seek partnerships because all the cases that we've looked into um, are programs that are not done only by the companies, but in collaboration with other organizations. And last but not least, or it should maybe be first, is that, of course, uh, it is important to secure the short and longer term supplier buy in in, to, in order to make those programs successful. Um, in the report, we will offer uh, a roadmap for companies that um, are um, uh, planning or are, are want to explore uh, also investing in those uh, in supply chain um, workforce programs. Um, and um, well, you see this at the right end snapshot. Um, and last, but uh, the last message that I wanted to give you is um, in that roadmap, start small before scaling up and um, collaborate with other organizations, including also the Workforce Nutrition Alliance. Thank you, Lawrence, over to you. Thank you, Mariah, wise, wise words. And I really appreciated the focus on trust. Uh, it's about trust and relationships with the, the people you do business with. And it's about trust with your employees. Um, I think Workforce Nutrition shows that you care about your employees. And I think it, it builds trust with suppliers along the supply chain and value chains. So it's not only the right thing to do, Workforce Nutrition, it's really the smart thing for employers to do. Um, and Victoria, over to you now, um, results from the World Benchmark Alliance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Florence. And it has been very insightful to hear Mariah's comments and, and to, um, to have a preview on, on the ex exciting results. I'll, I'll do a bit similar, but then more concise. Uh, as at the World Benchmarking Alliance, we focus on the SDGs broadly, so in many different sectors, uh, and I'm responsible for the food and agriculture team, where we've looked at 350 companies. Uh, we took a value chain approach, so these 350 companies are uh, from uh, upstream to downstream, so from agriculture input, animal protein traders, uh, all the way to retails and food service providers. Um, we took a holistic approach whereby nutrition uh, equivalents for 30% of the scoring and one of the important indicators in nutrition was workforce nutrition, but that was a very clearly directed um, uh, when we were looking at employees and today we're focusing, of course, on supply chains. So supply chains, um, uh, we've seen that there is less disclosure, uh, a difference between the work of uh, the Access to Nutrition initiative and us is that uh, the WBA looks at publicly available information. Uh, so we've seen that, that that we really should be encouraging businesses to share these data and to share their experiences because there's many learnings in it. And a few examples uh, I would want to pick out here today from across the value chain that we've seen um, are, uh, are from, from, from different parts. So you see ADM, uh, one of the companies more upstream working with agricultural commodities. They have programs in Uganda, for example, with video training. Um, and that really also focuses on enhancing smallholder farmer nutrition. So really going um, a step beyond just uh, focusing on, on, on helping farmers with productivity and access to market, but also focusing on that nutrition element. DSM, of course, a great leader in, in nutrition, also has specific workforce nutrition programs, working together with the Sun Business Network, which have been very impactful. We've seen that company, another company upstream uh, like ICL, uh, which is a fertilizing company, has also specific programs, in this case, in partnership with um, USAID, uh, focusing on smallholders 
uh, that are uh, working in the horticultural uh, sector. So really making sure that the productivity in that field improves so that for the farmers and their communities, there is an improved variety and diversity of, of nutritional intake available. Then another uh, upstream company, uh, which I'd like to highlight is OCP, a uh, Moroccan state-owned fertilizing company, does a lot with farmers, very farmer focused to improve um, their productivity, really looking at soil health, how soil health can make sure that the products and the crops are more nutritious. Um, so they're also, it, it, it's an emerging area really to see how all of these activities can can be measured in more nutritional uh, impact. Something more concretely from Hershey, uh, the chocolate brand, we've seen that they were sharing their work uh, in the Coca for Good program, uh, which supports livelihoods for Coca communities and in, in includes specifically nutrition education programs. And the final example I would want to share with you today is from the palm oil company Sim and Darby, and which actually has uh, set up grocery stores in their remote plantations to improve workers' access to fresh and nutritious foods. And I found this final one uh, really uh, inspiring to see that it's not only within your own influence sphere to look at, 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 at very clearly linked to your own products that you're selling, whether it's a fertilizer or commodities, but actually going a step further into seeing how you can really make a difference in the lives of your supply chain workers. So just a few um, uh, clear uh, sets of goals to action. Uh, so to look at employees, but look beyond employees, look at all the impact a company has on its supply chain. And if you set targets, if you set ambitions next to make it actionable. Um, I really liked what uh, Marai was sharing from Adni to say, start small. Start small, but make it actionable and also share. Be brave to share your learnings, share the data, because it's all in development. Nobody has found the holy grail yet how to measure impact on nutrition and food security through these, these um, uh, initiatives, but we're all making steps towards improving it. So we're really learning from, from each other. And we see uh, different, uh, in, in, in help with the Workforce Nutrition Alliance, community of practice sessions coming about. Uh, so that's really a great platform. And just finally, make sure to, to bring investors uh, along on this journey, on what companies are doing, what your company is doing. And it's, it has been really inspiring to hear the Honorable Secretary from Bangladesh, because a government leadership is so important and can really catalyze companies to do more and to really focus on their supply chains and look from it uh, look at it from a different lens so looking forward to the other contributions and here to answer any questions in the q a thank you victoria that was fantastic thank you thank you for some great examples uh, thank you for reminding us about the need to bring investors along uh, and to the importance of sharing. I didn't realize that the public disclosure was quite as big an issue as it is when we talk about supply chain workers. So thank you for putting out a call to action around that. And thank you again for reminding us that we're going beyond employees. When I joined GAIN, I kept calling the workforce program or the workplace program. And my colleagues gently reminded me that it goes beyond the workplace into the workforce. Uh, so thank you for reminding us that again. So now we have a panel with um, representatives from two of the trailblazer companies in this space. Um, we, uh, they're going to tell us a bit about, you know, why they do these programs in their supply chains uh, and what, what, what are the benefits for them and for their workers and what do they recommend for uh, peer, their peers, the other companies, what, how should they start? Should they start small? Where do they start? And what are some of the challenges they may have to overcome and, and how to overcome those? So these are some of the topics that we may well touch on. So my, uh, I'm going to introduce both speakers. The first is from Olam International. Her name is Burju Turke, and, and Burju is the Global Manager for Sustainability in Edible Nuts, and she's based in uh, Turkey, and um, from VF Asia Limited, which is a garment industry, we have Jens As. And Jens is a program manager uh, working in the worker and community development. So, um, Burju, over to you first. Um, tell us about Olam. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. So, I will first share my screen. Yeah. 
Yes, so hi everyone. It's a pleasure to be uh, with all of you today um, in this panel. Um, so I'm the Global Sustainability Manager for the Nuts business in, in Olam. So I wanted to share with this beautiful picture of nuts that uh, we are all uh, you know, consuming in our daily lives and hopefully you know, um, uh, getting a um, good diet. Um, so in our nuts business, we are focusing on products such as cashews, almonds, hazelnuts, walnut, pistachio, so all those delicious nuts. And we're um, looking at sustainability programs in, in the origins that these nuts are produced. Um, so if we're looking at cashews, we have sustainability programs in uh, West Africa and Cote d'Ivoire, in Ghana and Nigeria, and also in Asia and Vietnam and India. And if we're talking about almonds, we uh, change our hat and we become farmers. So we have our own almond orchards. Um, and if we talk about hazelnuts, we talk about turkey and working with small farm holders in, in our supply chains. Um, so why workforce nutrition? Um, so I think Mariah has uh, from ATME has you know, clearly stated and Lawrence, you yourself also with the statistics and the numbers. So the numbers don't look good. Um, so we know that poor diet is as top driver for early death. And when we look at our, our workforce, most of our workforce, like 75% are in the countries where malnutrition is high. And uh, when uh, we look at the numbers of adults spending at least one third of their time in their working context. So these can be in the farming, this can be in orchards or factories or, or offices. So for these reasons, as Olam, we're committed to improve nutrition for people in our workforce. And when we say workforce, uh, yes, we say the, the farmers in our supply chain, as well as our own employees working in our offices and in factories. But for, the, uh, for today's call, I will only focus the activities that we do in our uh, um, workplaces, so on the employees, so that we set an example for our peers and other companies. And hopefully, you know, we will have uh, more example companies like uh, like us who are focusing on workforce um, nutrition. Um, so taking all this in mind, we have this ambitious call, goal as Olam that 100% of our total workforce will have access to nutrition programs. And to do this, we're scaling up action in our work sites across the four priority areas of the Workforce Nutrition Alliance. Um, so we're looking at healthy food at work, nutrition education, nutrition focused health checks, and breastfeeding support. So when we have this ambitious target, we're like, where to start? So I think that's like the question that everyone has. Like, yes, we have the four pillars, but where do we start? So I think um, the, the best part, and um, I, I really like that start small, um, wording. Yes, we start small and we need to know where we are. What is the baseline? So we take the example of uh, Workforce Nutrition Alliance scorecard and we have asked all our offices, factories and work sites to do a self-assessment of themselves under those four priority areas. And I'm sharing the slide where you can see, you know, um, the results um, of those self-assessment. Um, so that every um, factory or the workplace has been asked by their HR or their managers to, to answer the questions around the, the four priority areas. And then the, the scores gave us four categories for levels of the beginner, bronze, silver, and gold. So we are proud that we have um, gold standard and silver standard facilities, but we're also motivated that we have beginners so that it will help us show the improvement points of those beginner facilities so that they can you know, improve um, their workforce nutrition. So we have issued workforce nutrition scorecards for each single facility. And um, so I just wanted to show you two examples of how we did that. So the first one is we take in our uh, work site in Vietnam, uh, which we're proud that they have the gold status uh, under um, after completing the self-assessment. And um, so, we uh, collect their points under the scorecards so under these four um, priority areas. You can see that's you know food, 
they get 26 points, education, checkups, and breastfeeding. So their total score is 77, which puts them in the gold status. Um, so it shows them, you know, where are the improvement points under each of the priority area. And then we give them recommendations on how to improve their score. So on the right hand side, you um, see that, you know, how we um, kind of uh, give recommendations, you know, maybe they can increase your know, more encourage the consumption of nutritious foods at the workplace and, you know, raise awareness through posters and promotions, or they can have, you know, structure their monitoring um, of the workforce nutrition by identifying KPIs and reporting regularly on those KPIs. Or if you want to look at another scorecard uh, where, um, you know, we, um, we have an example of, um, you know, we clearly see that under education and checkups, this facility needs improvement. So what can be the point or the, the starting point for this facility to, to focus on, uh, on those um, pillars that they're actually, you know, have space for improvement. So there are different set of recommendations for these facilities so that they can, uh, you know, improve their workforce nutrition. So um, we think that uh, this exercise showed us, you know, uh, on an, and the nuts business, where are each facility and the work site, and what can be the improvement points that we can do um, to improve nutrition among our employees. And um, so this is not limited to our nuts uh, business. So we're now scaling up to other products and other origins so that all the um, Olam uh, uh, employees have access to nutrition programs um, in and globally. So thank you. I'm open to questions also. Thank you, Berger. That was great. Um, I liked your I very much liked your point about where to start. It's quite intimidating sometimes for an employer to know where to start. And uh, thank you for the example of the scorecards because you know it gave us it gave us a really uh, concrete example. And I really liked the way that you, the scorecards weren't simply a rating mechanism, they were a mechanism for developing recommendations for improvement, even for the gold standard um, uh, employer sites. And of course, these scorecards could be used uh, for any of your, with any of your suppliers, presumably as well. So thank you so much for that. Um, now over to Jens from VF. V, uh, Jens, over to you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks for inviting VF to speak. Um, for those who don't know, VF Corporation, we are one of the world's largest apparel, footwear, accessories companies. Uh, our family of brands includes, among others, Vans, The North Face, Timberland, Supreme, and Dickies. And our purpose is to power movements of sustainable and active lifestyles for the betterment of people and our planet. Nearly 1 million people make, move, or sell VF products every day in our supply chain, spanning across more than 40 countries worldwide. And through our worker and community development program, we use VF Scale as a global company. Our influence and insights to improve the lives of fu uh, and futures of the workers and communities that support our global supply chain. So the design of our program is based on the findings of a uh, needs assessment uh, in which we collect the uh, feedback from thousands of workers in our supply chain to identify issues that are most salient to their lives and well-being. And the results from these needs assessments have led our program to focus on three key pillars, which are one, uh, access to water and sanitation, two, advocate health and nutrition, and three, affordable childcare and education. And now through our needs assessment, we, we have seen that workers living situations and needs, they vary widely between countries where we operate. And then in Bangladesh, which is the example I'm gonna talk about, uh, we see that many workers are malnourished and underweight, and the majority of the female workers are anemic. There's little knowledge around nutrition and nutritious diets among the workforce and access to affordable and nutritious food is limited. So therefore, by partnering with the GAIN in Bangladesh and setting up the workforce nutrition program that we have with them, our goal is then to increase the overall consumption of nutritious food among factory workers and thereby improving the, the health and well-being 
of the workforce. In factories where there is a, an established food offering, uh, the meals that workers receive in the factories may have a very significant impact on their health and well being. It therefore made very much sense for us to start working with factories having canteens and strengthen the knowledge of the management, the canteen staff, and food suppliers to ensure that food offerings are nutritious while also interacting with workers directly to increase knowledge and demand for nutritious food, both inside and outside of the factory walls. In factories where there are no established food offerings currently and access to affordable nutritious food in the community is, is relatively poor. And we have developed the concept of a fair price shop, which we have then within the factories in which workers can access essential items that they need. So what are the benefits uh, for different stakeholders, uh, for the workers? Um, we want, as I said, to say, uh, see an intake, an increased intake of nutritious food. Um, and through the piloting results from our uh, Bangladesh project with GAIN, we, um, the results have shown good indications of increased weight, BMI, improved blood levels, and a significant increase in the nutritional knowledge among workers. And this leads to workers being more healthy and happier at work. Uh, with improved food offerings and services from the factory, workers feel safer and more protected by their employer, which then generates um, positive impacts on the business as well, which would be in terms of reduced sick, sick leave and absenteeism, um, which lead then to improved productivity levels. We see that workers are becoming more loyal, improving worker retention and lowering turnover and recu recruitment and training costs for the factories. A healthier workforce also builds health uh, resilience in the factories, making the workforce better protected against outbreaks of diseases, uh, most recently the COVID-19 pandemic being one, one example of that. So all, all these are very good business impacts um, which the factories would experience from, from the interventions. And for VF, investing into suppliers workforce um, is a good way for us to build strong long-term relationships with our suppliers, which is then essential for ensuring continuous and re reliable supply in our production. It also strengthens our reputation as a responsible company and stakeholder in the communities where we operate and hence our local license to operate is um, strengthened. When designing a program intervention, it is key for us that we build shared values between VEF, factories, workers, and the communities at large to increase commitment and ownership among all involved stakeholders, enabling the program interventions to also live beyond the, the implementation stage. So I think I will leave it at that and I'm also looking forward to answering any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jens. I really like the word you used, uh, protected. Employers feel protected. I remember when we launched the Alliance two and a half years ago, we had an ILO uh, representative who was one of the leaders of the, um, the Wellbeing at Work initiative. And he was giving us examples of how uh, workplace nutrition programs, especially around food, really made, made employees and workers feel as if their company cared about them. It was a very, uh, very powerful, primal, cultural sense of, of, of duty of care. And I, I really like the fact that you used the word protected and big congratulations to VF for its, its leadership in this space. And we are delighted, of course, again, to be working with you. We have time for some questions, colleagues. We have a we have a question in the Q and A chat. It'd be great if I can ask you to uh, put your questions in the Q and A or in the chat box, just simply because we don't have that much time, and I want to make sure we give everyone a chance. So I'm going to ask the panelists, and in fact any of our any of our panelists who've spoken, if they would like to address this one question from Mamunul Islam. Uh, and Mamunul asks a really good question. I think, you know, we, we talk about um, wanting to provide more nutritious food in the workforce or in the workplace, but nutritious food tends to, not always, but tends to be more expensive than other kinds of food. So how do we, how do we, do, how do we deal with that? How do we mitigate that and, and manage it? Has anyone got any practical examples? And this can be from 
Olam VF um, Atni or WBA or 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 uh, his His Excellency from Bangladesh as well. Anyone got any examples or strategies for dealing with this? No. Well, I would imagine I would imagine that it'd be what my answer to you, Mamunu, would be uh, companies with the the reach and power of uh, Olam and and VF have significant negotiating power within within the within their countries the, of operation and within the sectors to negotiate and procure food that is um, more nutritious uh, at a, a maybe a, a a discounted rate from from various procurement and very various buyers. That's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is to find foods that are really nutritious, but perhaps less obvious. Um, uh, green leafy, some green leafy vegetables in some of the countries that Gain operates in are very affordable. They're just not in the spotlight very much. Um, and other ways, of course, are using um, uh, staple foods that are fortified with things like vitamin A, uh, zinc, and iron that are routinely consumed by consumers in Europe and North America, but not routinely consumed throughout many of the countries where the supply chains draw, draw from. So those would be my answers. And if anyone else would like to add, please, please feel free to do so. Um, I believe we have a question from Peter. Uh, is that, do we have that in the Q&A box? Or would Peter like to tell us what his question is? Peter Hurst. Peter, over to you. Can you keep it brief, please? I think it was possibly a mistake. I didn't put a, a question in, but anyway, I'm, I'm just, I was just writing you a message to say thanks for the uh, discussion. Very interesting. And I'll be communicating this information back to the agricultural and food unions around the world. Um, we've already had feedback that they're not aware of the initiative. So this is a good opportunity to, uh, you know, to make, to make sure they know what, what you're doing, what the various organizations involved are. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Peter. And I know, I know Peter is a big champion of improving uh, workforce, workplace conditions, decent work, living wages. And I think this kind of initiative, it's so powerful if, if it can be wrapped up in those even bigger initiatives around the, the quality of, uh, of work and workers' rights. Um, colleagues, any other questions <coughs> from the floor or from the uh, chat box? Uh, Jen, please, please let me know if there are any. If there aren't any, I've got a couple of questions I, for, our, for our panelists. Lawrence, if I could, Lawrence, if I could step in. I know Jen's wanted to contribute oh, to please, that question, yeah. and uh, Maria all, and uh, uh, Maria also would like to. Okay, great. Thank you. Go ahead, colleagues. Jen's. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, no, I just wanted to build on the, the question, the previous question that came because uh, I was sort of hesitant to answer first because we haven't really been involved in negotiating affordable prices um, for, for our factories. Um, but I would is, say- is what, is what I said, does that sound plausible or is that fantasy land? I, I, it's difficult, like we maybe it's not in our role maybe to, we are firstly, we are not a food and beverage company and we don't have that kind of supply chain. So we have in the first place very little leverage to give in, in helping our factories bargaining better uh, prices. But I think what we are trying to do is to showcase for our suppliers that there's a very strong business case in providing the workforce with healthy, nutritious food, which would then translate into a better business performance a more loyal workforce, which will then eventually outweigh the additional cost for buying in more high quality nutritious food so so that's what we are trying to do through our project to, to really showcase that business case for our factories so that's how we are using our power to to drive this forward thank you Jens. none of this is easy i mean gain just started its own work, uh, workforce nutrition program. Our organization, we're only about 300 people, so we're a small organization, um, and that, but that's only for our, our own employees. So we are going to also have to think about how do we influence the, the partners and suppliers that we work with? So this is a challenge for everybody. Um, Mariah, did you want to come in? 
Yeah, thanks, Lawrence. Um, and I also provided an answer in the in the chat. Um, of course, um, well, the workforce nutrition and and the um, workforce nutrition, both in for in, in in own companies as well as in supply chains, are an important aspect uh, that Adni considers uh, when assessing companies on their investments in nutrition. Um, but of course, uh, that always, and that's what we uh, try to uh, to promote, of course. Um, comp should be of go hand in hand that companies also uh, invest in healthy food and making that affordable and accessible. Um, so that, that is that is one thing that I wanted to highlight. Um, and then another thing that we came across, um, and it maybe yourself and also Jens uh, can can say a little bit more about that, is that we uh, saw also in the the VF Corporation uh, case that we looked at um, that. That uh, program also uh, includes um, uh, a fair price uh, shop uh, around. Um, well, the, the 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 case that we looked at, um, which was I think um, uh, done together with uh, with Gain. Um, but maybe um, you can say yourself a little bit more about that. Thanks. Jens, do you want to come in here, and then I'm going to turn to uh, Bourjou, who wants to come in as well. Sure. Um, yeah, no, we, we, as I also mentioned, we, we are trying also to, to set up a fair price shop option for factories where we see that there, there isn't a canteen or a established um, food offering uh, on site, or even if there are uh, limited um, food options in the communities where the workers live. Um, so, so this is a model that we have been developing um, with GAIN. And the business case has been established and we are now working with one factory to try this concept out. So this is just still in the very beginning of being uh, um, tried out. And I think we are also very keen to see the results of this. For, I think it, it's a, the concept is, is very great because um, it will then allow workers to um, get groceries, um, healthy groceries um, at a lower price directly from the factories and they don't need to spend time outside of work hours to to find um, those good offerings that are very difficult to find um, most likely in their communities so it's also a way for them to to save time and as you know um, garment workers long work hours they are usually female with children at home to take care of so anything that this also model can help them to access the, the food, the nutritious food they need uh, in a timely and cost-effective way would be um, highly beneficial for, um, for garment worker families. Um, so yeah, we are very excited about testing this pot with GAIN and um, we, we are working with our suppliers on, on testing this out. Thank you. Thank you, Jens. Um, Bourjou, yeah. could you tell us a little bit about well, uh, you wanted to come in on one of the questions, but while you have the floor, can you also tell us a little bit about next steps, uh, practical next steps for, for sure. Ola? Sure, thank you, Lawrence. Um, yes, I wanted to come in because, yeah, as I said, we're in the preliminary stages and we're looking at healthy food at work part. And so um, I think the keywords on, on the nutri nutritious food will be affordable and accessible. Um, so how we can make it affordable and accessible. Are we going to provide canteens with free meals? And are we going to look at the content of the, or the ingredients in the, in the uh, meals that, that is being provided? In some origins, we don't have canteens, but are they any subsidized food in those factories? Or how is the whole, you know, break structure in the factories so that the working hours are, um, um, designed according to, you know, uh, accommodate all these different situations, uh, like Jens has um, pointed out. So all these things, I think, have to be looked at. And this is this is not only, you know, sometimes these are all things like, oh, these are what work for, so it should be like the factory management or the HR. But I think this is like a comprehensive and collaborative approach. And the private sector is not alone here. Um, so we have the non-governmental organizations and um, other institutions and local authorities. We have the honorary secretary with us today. So I think um, there is much room to grow. Um, so it's just, we need to start digging into it and looking at 
you know, what are the points that we can focus on and then uh, move from there. And what are the next steps? So the next steps is, um, so um, the recommendations on the scorecard. So we have now identified, right, the points are there, the recommendations are there. So what's next? So we asked our um, workforce, uh, the work sites or the workplaces to identify some quick wins that they can do in six months period and in longer term, one to two years. Because as Olam, you're going to invest in workforce nutrition. But first, we wanted to do the baseline. So now all these you know, identified um, factories and offices, they have identified their action plans. And what is important is the monitoring and evaluation. So it's not only, you know, oh, we have an action for short term or an action that will be completed in the long term in the upcoming years, but how are we going to monitor the progress and make it sustainable so that this is part of the ongoing daily business cycle. Thank you. I, I think I love the practicality of your of your next steps and your way forward. And thank you for reminding us that this is not just about the private sector. This is about um, public sector. Very often governments uh, and NGOs are enormous employers of, of people, sometimes as almost as big as the private sector. And so they also have a responsibility to, to do this. And, and uh, you know, I, I just, just to say to Olam and VF, your work is is really inspiring so many others, and it's inspiring us. Um, so so thank you for your for your work. We we have a question from uh, this is the final question before I turn over to um, Wei Chan Chan of Consumer Goods Forum from Nazneen. Nazneen Huck, would you like to ask a question briefly? Nazneen, uh, over to you. You're on mute, I think. me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, it's not exactly a question. Uh, I've been working with the uh, RMG sector for the last 20 years. And uh, I do agree with all that has been discussed today. Uh, but there is also an, another aspect for, especially for Bangladeshi workers, the knowledge level. Mm. So what we found that uh, they do not really understand what is nutritious food? For them, they think the expensive food which they cannot really have regularly are the nutritious food. But when through our education programs, we spoke to them, talked to them and showed the regular uh, things that they have been eating contain similar kind of nutrition. And uh, believe me, they were so happy because at the end of each of the sessions, they would come to us and say, now we are at peace because we think we can uh, feed our children with nutritious food with the wage that we earn. And yeah. I think that is also a very, very important aspect for Bangladeshi workers to know that the nutritious content of a local fruit is almost equivalent to a imported apple. So that is, I think, uh, education for workers is extremely, uh, is something that we should also uh, keep in the agenda. Thank you, Nazneen. Thank you for reminding us of that. And nutrition education is one of the components of most good workforce nutrition programs. And I think, I think Mariah also mentioned uh, it, this as well. So thank you for giving us a really good example of how moving to nutritious foods may not necessarily be more expensive. Um, thank you colleagues for really great comments, questions. Um, now I'm gonna turn it over to Wei Chan. Chan Wei Chan is the managing director of our partner uh, at the uh, Workforce Nutrition Alliance, the Consumer Goods Forum. Wei Chan, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Lawrence. And, and thank you everyone for, for attending today's uh, wonderful session. Uh, we're very proud to be partners with, with GAIN on this uh, very important initiative, and it's good to hear from people's, uh, pe pe people's views and also uh, to get some in insights today. Um, and thank you especially to the panelists and to the speakers. I've learned a lot, um, 
and it's some fantastic insight. And, to, and, and this is the first time we've done one where we actually have extended it into the supply chain. So I think that's also a very important aspect today. And it's also good to have food and non-food involved because typically, you know, when we when we talk to a, 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 to some of these audiences, we're very much focused on the food side, so food manufacturers, food retailers, etc. But now ha having uh, VF, we've, I guess we've gone from nuts to North Face today, if you look at it from that point of view. So I guess we've had a broader uh, spectrum. So that's also uh, fantastic as well. Um, to me, the main takeaways are uh, there's, there's a very clearly a, a case uh, for action, right? Um, and it's good to see that the government's involved. And I, I think having um, uh, the Honourable Secretary from, from Bangladesh speak about how important this whole aspect is to their economy, I think that's uh, kind of like a contextual setting piece, which is also absolutely critical. But I think the case for doing something on workforce nutrition, especially as it relates to supply chain, I think is crystal clear. Uh, we've said many times that it's great for economic growth for the country, so therefore links to the uh, ambitions of the country. We also have said that it's great for the, uh, the companies themselves, so it's an economic benefit to the companies. Um, and, and so therefore, you know, the, the case for doing something uh, should, be, should be absolutely crystal clear. And I, I think we should not be hiding from that fact and therefore should be acting very, very quickly. And I, I, I guess the, the difference between the supply chain and your own operations is something that was brought out today in the sense that um, by building great relationships with your suppliers and helping them through um, improving the nutrition of their employees actually gives you that special um, relationship, I guess, with the supplier. So therefore you're actually locking in your suppliers, which is also something very, very important. I think that particular aspect came across very clearly today, which is very different from just doing it for your own employees because your own employees you know, work in your own companies, but having that strategic relationship and investing in the supplier not just investing in their technology, et cetera, and, and the relationship, but also investing in helping their, 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 their um, employees uh, become more um, uh, fed better is actually something that's very, very important. But then, so, so the case is clear, but the, then the question always becomes, how do you do it, right? And I think there's a few things that I learned today, um, not in any particular order, but one has to tailor the, the interventions to the local contextual uh, component, especially considering that we're talking about food. Um, start small and then try and find a way to scale it, get investors involved. I, I think importantly, someone said today, let's have some small wins. So, so get some, get some um, uh, runs on the board, get some goals in uh, rather than winning the, the whole tournament straight away. Let's get a few goals and score, you know, win a few matches before we win the actual tournament. Sharing, I think, came across very clearly. Having a scorecard was also very important. I think having that scorecard is fantastic. Uh, and, and I think also well, what I learned today is using your influence and scale to make a difference because, you know, where, where you have a big company, you also have, you know, with, with a big company, you have big responsibility and therefore using that big responsibility to, put, to try and encourage the supply chain to also um, improve the workforce, their workforce nutrition is also very important and being collaborative and finding ways to work government, work investors, work all these different pieces is, is also absolutely critical. So I, 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 I felt that the case is very clearly there. It's a question of now getting it done. There's some very practical things about getting it done. And I love the fact that um, one of our, um, uh, one of our um, um, guests today, Peter, mentioned that he wants them uh, to, to connect us with the um, a broader network. And I think that's, that's really what we're here to do, to try and um, let people know what we're doing and then find ways to scale it. And we do have tools that can be used and best practices that we can use and, and those things. And so it's a question of um, being ready to be able to provide this to a wider audience. And it's great that you guys are, are here and it's great that you guys are interested in the topic and we're here to help. And if there's anything that we can do to help you improve that nutrition, either in your own operations or in your own supply, in, in your supply chains, please do let us know. And we're very happy to to try and help help and try to make this a very important aspect of uh, people's lives. So thank you very much for today and thank you for the for the great discussion panelists and and, and speakers and uh, good luck everybody. Uh, have a happy Thanksgiving if you're America and uh, see you hopefully some of you quite soon. Thank you. Thank you Wei Chan. Um, and we'll call it uh, we'll bring the session to an end now. For me workforce nutrition is one of those rare uh, actions where reward and duty of care are perfectly aligned and we've heard that from all the speakers today reward and duty of care are perfectly aligned at the national level 
we heard that from the Honorable Secretary. Uh, at the investor level, we heard that from ATNI uh, and WBA. At the reputation level, we also heard that from our speakers. Uh, at the employee level, and as Wei Chan said, big employers have a big responsibility. And so it needs to also be at the supplier and supply chain level. So colleagues, thank you for the inspiration. There is, there is another session, just to mark the importance of this topic, there is another session on this in the Nutrition for Growth, not organized by, by GAIN or CGF, but very much in the spirit of what GAIN and CGF are doing. It's organized by CARE and IFAD. It's next Thursday. Watch out for it. I think Christina from, from GAIN will be presenting, be one of the presenters. Watch out for that. But colleagues, um, thank you, participants, panelists, honorable secretary, um, participants, uh, listeners, everyone who asked questions and made and panelists. Thank you for a great session and um, make your commitments, colleagues. If, if, if you employ anyone or you work with anyone who employs anyone, uh, make your commitments. Start small, but start powerfully. Thank you. Have a good day. Have a good week. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Lawrence Haddad. Bye bye. Thank okay. you, Honorable Secretary. Good luck. Good luck. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank bye. you. Stay Thank safe. You. Thank you. Bye. Good Thanksgiving, American colleagues. Bye.